This is the Brain Over Belly podcast, solving the puzzle of obesity with Dr. David Brown of Idaho BMI. Cholesterol, we hear about it all the time, but what if the info we're getting isn't telling the whole story? Today, Dr. Brown explains why LVL, the supposedly bad cholesterol, gets such a bad rap and why it shouldn't. Here's your guest host, Mona. Hey, Mona here. I'm filling in for Rick this month, and today we are going to talk about cholesterol. Now, it's something we've all heard about. I know I certainly have from my doctors, and it's something we all get tested for if we're going to do regular checkups. Now, I'm excited to connect with Dr. Brown again today on this topic, and because I'm his patient, he always teaches me something new. So, hi, Dr. Brown. How are you doing, Mona? I'm good. It's good to see you today. It's so great to see you and be here with you. So we're going to talk about cholesterol and what's the first thing we need to know about cholesterol? Cholesterol's good. What? Uh, Cholesterol is necessary for life and for health. Super important. If we didn't have cholesterol in our bodies, we'd die very, very quickly. And why is that? It is a fundamental building block Uh, For all of our cells, every cell in the body builds or makes cholesterol. And we need it for a lot of different things, including the membranes around cells. You know, you've seen those diagrams. Cholesterol is super important for those outer membranes of cells. Uh, They are the building blocks for a lot of the hormones that are super important for us, whether it's estrogen or testosterone, a lot of different things. So I've only heard it's bad. Yeah, I know. That's a very common perception, and it's wrong. Okay, that's interesting. So why is cholesterol and its tests so misunderstood? Well, um, for a long time now, 60 years, something like that, uh, really the thought has been that cholesterol or having a high cholesterol is really one of the, if not the most significant drivers of heart disease or coronary artery disease. You know, the idea that that you have a buildup of cholesterol in your the walls of your arteries, the arteries in your heart, and that causes heart attacks. And, and that's true, but this idea that it's simply having high cholesterol that is driving that whole problem, it's a very flawed and incomplete idea of it. Now, what about plaque in the arteries? Is that the same thing as cholesterol? Well, the plaques. um, The coronary arteries, which are the arteries supplying the heart tissue, muscle with oxygen and nutrients. um, Yes, people develop plaques in the walls of those arteries, but they also develop them in other places. The carotid arteries going into the brain the abdomen, a lot of different places. It just happens to be that the heart is one place where those plaques develop. Um, But essentially the definition of atherosclerosis is having cholesterol molecules in a certain cell type in the wall of the blood vessels. There's inflammation going on in the walls of the blood vessels. Now we've talked a lot about inflammation throughout the body. Yes, And how... um your operations calm that, mm-hmm. if I'm getting that Yeah, correct. that's one of the main targets that we're going after yeah, is inflammation. Yeah, because I feel calmed. Oh, good, <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, after my operation, it seems like uh, cholesterol, to me, is very confusing, and I'm sure it is to most people. So what is bad cholesterol? What is good cholesterol? Okay, so there are different types of carriers of cholesterol. So you think of a person's uh, blood stream, you know, I got blood circulating throughout the body, delivering a lot of things to all the cells of the body. One of the things that's being delivered is cholesterol as well as fats. Um, And that's typically in a carrier that we call LDL, low density lipoprotein. And a lot of people, including a lot, a lot of people in the medical community refer to that as bad cholesterol. And that's, To be bold, that's crazy. Um, It's not bad cholesterol. Again, if we didn't have that, we would die very, very quickly. But there are other things that we refer to as cholesterol. There's HDL, and sometimes that's uh, referred to as good cholesterol. 
Um, and why? Why is that one good? Because it's thought that, well, it's a little complicated, but HDL, uh, if that's low, when HDL is low, that's associated with other risk factors for developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. When it's high, uh, the risk is much lower. And so I th think that just with that basic understanding, the tendency for people is to refer to that as the good cholesterol. So Makes sense. These, you know, you have, I have right now, billions if not trillions of these little particles, LDL particles, flowing throughout your body, and they're very important. And the number one job of that LDL cholesterol is to deliver fat to the different cells of your body to be burned as fuel. It's the number one job. Um, but also on that particle are molecules of uh, cholesterol and protein. Um, so those are traveling everywhere really in our bodies, and they have a very important role. The bad cholesterol's job is to carry fat to burn as fuel, which is a clean fuel source and will help you lose weight. And yet I've been told I need to get rid of that? Yes, that's the general message from a large portion of the medical community and society. And it goes back again, probably 60 years. So the liver, the liver is the organ that creates these LDL particles, the LDL, HDL particles. Um, and from the liver, they go out into the blood and around uh, the body and they deliver these fat molecules, triglycerides. Um, yes, they're deliverers of fuel. That's their primary job. Wow. To compare it to another very common problem, think about knees. I see a lot of patients who have knee problems and who've had joint replacements, knee replacements. It, we could, if we were using similar logic, to look at all these joint replacements, these knee replacements, and conclude that, well, knees must be bad. Let's just start replacing everybody's knees. A human knee is bad. Let's replace everybody's knees. Wow, that's pretty LDL wrong. is just like that. In other words, it serves a very, very important function. The problem is when those LDL particles become damaged or modified. Those modified LDL particles are the problem. Those, sure, I would call those the bad cholesterol. But just having maybe a higher than normal LDL level in the blood does not necessarily mean that this is leading to atherosclerosis. It's, it's really when those LDL particles are damaged or modified. So tell me about the damaged cholesterol. How does it get damaged? Well, when I was in high school for a year or so, uh, I had a car that I hated. It was a Pinto. <laughs> Remember the Ford Pinto? Yes. I hated it. So ugly. It was yellow. And uh, it was rusted to the point that the body had broken off of the frame of the car. And I drove it around still. You could look down, see the road beneath your feet a little bit. Wow. So we're all familiar with rust. Yes. Um, you know, you think of rust, you think of that classic red-ish color. That really is iron, the element of iron that has been oxidized, rusting. When it's green, that's copper that's being oxidized. But that's the general idea with rust is that over time it reacts with oxygen in the air and it becomes rusted. Well, one of the main uh, modifications of those LDL particles is very similar to that. It becomes oxidized and you can think of it as being rusted, just like that old Pinto. Wow. Yeah. That's a great example of Pinto. Wow, I never would have thought of you yes. and Pinto. So that's one of, there are other things. There's a whole series of steps in modification or damage of these LDL particles, but that's one of the main ones that people are really focused on. So when those LDL particles become damaged, the cells don't recognize those particles like they would a healthy LDL particle. And through a series of damaging steps, 
eventually the body gets to a point that it recognizes that damaged LDL particle as foreign. Uh, in other words, it doesn't look to the immune system like a healthy part of your body. And so what happens is eventually your immune system starts attacking those damaged LDL particles. And then there's, there's this big systemic reaction to those damaged LDL particles. And so what's happening in the walls of the blood vessels of the heart, it's simply a part of that immune system reaction to these damaged LDL particles. So isn't that good that the immune system is attacking the damaged particles? Yes, but eventually it gets to the point. It's it's like COVID, you know, mm-hmm. that's all familiar to us. And with folks who had this infection, this COVID virus infection, really the people who suffered the most were the people whose immune systems overreacted. So people got pneumonia, you know, the infection in the lungs, and that's bad enough. But uh, the worst cases were folks in which the immune system, system overreacted and ended up damaging that person's lungs. So it was sort of a, an attack on self that was the big problem. So it's very similar to that. I see. Okay, that makes sense to me. Because I've known a lot of people that have had uh, their immune system basically attack their healthy body. Absolutely. I mean, autoimmune disorders, they're very, very common nowadays. And so we're seeing a pattern of a lot of diseases that are very common now that weren't in the past. Right. So I would even go so far as to say that coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis is one version or a type of autoimmune disorder. Wow. So if we eat a lot of sugar and carbs and processed foods, is that how we get uh, more of the bad cholesterol? And is that how it becomes damaged? That's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. If, you know, it goes back to what we've talked about a lot of times on this podcast, food, of course, is a very, very big part of it. Um, And one of the fundamental initial problems is the development of inflammation in the cells. And one of the things that can start that process is uh, overconsumption of carbohydrates and sugars, but also polyunsaturated fats. Now, a lot of people are used, uh, you know, accustomed to this term, the omega-3 fats, they're very good for us. Well, there's also another type of fat that's an omega-6 or omega-9, these different types of fats that are really a problem. Um, One, because they can start and drive that process of inflammation that's pushing all of this. And and it's very controversial because some big organizations actually recommend that people eat lower amounts of saturated fat and higher amounts of these polyunsaturated fats. Yeah, because I've heard of the omegas, like omega-3, omega-6, and they're they're supposed to be good for you. Omega-3s, yes, and there are some essential fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-6s. But if you look at our food source, um, it is filled with omega-6 vegetable oils, seed oils that actually are recommended. And I would tell you that's one of the fundamental problems in our food source. Those are not healthy fats. So you you can actually do these tests on people and you can test that ratio. In other words, you take a blood sample and you can test, well, how much omega-3 fat is in there compared to omega-6? And I would say that the best research would suggest that the healthiest ratio is one-to-one. Well, in Americans, that ratio is about 16 to one. In other words, 16 times more Omega-6, polyunsaturated fats compared to omega-3. That's and, a lot. Yeah. And, you know, there's this idea that saturated fat is bad. It is the devil. It's going to clog your arteries and, and That's do what terrible I've always things. heard. Yeah. All of those studies in the past that suggested that and made that conclusion, they were these epidemiological studies looking for patterns in people. Um, And the truth was they weren't conducted super well. Um, And the more recent, better structured studies just like that 
have concluded there's no association between saturated fat and atherosclerosis. I would suggest, I would tell I'm you. Shocked. <laughs> yeah, I'm shocked. I would tell you that saturated fat is the body's preferred, preferred fuel. It's saturated fat. Saturated so fat. So what would be a good oil? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would avoid the vegetable oils, seed oils, canola oil. I, eat, I have even backed away a bit from olive oil which just sounds crazy to people, but it's, mm -hmm. if you test these oils, you take them off the shelf, and this has been done by a lot of different groups, turns out that in these vegetable and seed oils, they're up in your cupboard, you're going to cook with it, you take them right out of your shelf and you test them, they're already oxidized. So remember, those fats are part of what's included in that LDL particle. And one of the fundamental ways it's damaged is for that particle to become oxidized or similar to being rusted. Well, if it's already oxidized in the bottle, that's a problem. And it turns out that saturated fats, they are far less likely or capable of becoming oxidized. Okay, what, Dr. Brown, so we... So we know what are the bad oils or the bad fats. What is something good that we could use in our diets and to cook with? So I use butter, tallow, ghee. These are animal product, animal-based fats uh, that I use, and I think that is a far healthier method of cooking and preparing food. Well, and that goes along with the keto diet that you have recommended as well. Yeah, again, I don't normally identify this way of living or eating by that name just because I think it's confusing to a lot of people. If We've made a lot of progress, I would say, in the last 10 years. A lot of people are familiar with this concept of keto, but there's still confusion. And I avoid the term because people, I think, can interpret it in a way that they think they should go into a store and things that are labeled keto, they should Oh, I get purchase. that. Absolutely. So, you need to read labels. What you're telling me is so different from what I've heard from my doctors and especially my heart doctors. What can I do to help myself be better and be healthier? Well, I have no interest in stepping on toes or causing a ruckus, but um, I think it's important to understand some of the research background. Um, there was a really important study done in the 70s called the Minnesota Heart Study. And it really couldn't be done today because basically what they did is they went into a mental, big mental health facility and they basically put half of the population in that facility on higher saturated fat diet. The other half, they lowered saturated fat and increased these polyunsaturated fats in the diets of everybody there and spent a lot of money. And it was a fairly well-constructed uh, study, took many years. And basically what happened is the lead investigators, they never really published the results and the paper. Well, they didn't initially, something like 15 years. Um, and it turned out what it showed is that eat, uh, these folks who were eating more polyunsaturated fats, they had higher rates of cardiac events and premature death. And so many years later, the lead investigator was being interviewed and the interviewer asked him, so why didn't you publish that data? And the response was, well, the results were unexpected. So you think about bias that that's pretty incredible just we expect we see what we are expecting and if something is unexpected we sort of just by nature want to avoid it sweep it under the rug so to speak mm, maybe wow um but i think that there's this tradition we have this idea in our minds so concretely it's the only thing we've ever been taught really that maybe we don't ask enough questions there's another study from 2009, more recent study, uh, 136,000 emergency room admissions. So 136,000 people admitted to the ER with cardiac events, in other words, heart attacks, heart failure, uh, in centers all around the country. And what they found is that 
in, I believe it was 52% of those people being admitted to the hospital through the ER with heart attacks, et cetera, 52% of them had a, an LDL cholesterol level that was in the quote unquote good range. So I know for me, that was something that really got my attention. Wait a minute, maybe there's something we're not seeing here. It's not just that blanket number of LDL, but there's something a little more nuanced and complicated that we're not seeing. So Dr. Brown, why are cardiologists pushing so hard for lower cholesterol levels? Well, I think their mindset, what they are seeing in their clinics and in their practices is people with coronary artery disease, heart disease. And so it's, it's a model of intervening and treating people who already have the disease. And so, you know, there's, there's sense to what they're doing from that standpoint. But from the standpoint of prevention, I think it's, it's, a, very, it's a very different perspective. I think if we understand really what's going on here with damaged LDL and what we can do to prevent damaged LDL, that's a much better approach to prevention of these diseases. What can we do instead to reduce our bad LDL and keep the good? Great question. It's the most important question. Um, again, just so we're clear, when I when we talk about bad cholesterol, it's not the generic LDL cholesterol. It's good. It's damaged LDL. Um, I totally agree. That's what we want to avoid. And the answer to that, how do we prevent that, is some of the same things that we've talked about in clinic and that we've talked about on this podcast. We want to lower insulin resistance. We want to lower inflammation. Um, and how do we do that? Well, what we are eating, getting sleep, all of the things that we've talked about a lot that really what we're targeting three fundamental things, insulin resistance, inflammation, and this neurological dysfunction that we've spoken so much about. Really in doing that, if we can reverse or prevent those fundamental drivers, um, we're going to be avoiding to the degree that we can this damage to those LDL particles. So, Yes, for somebody who has the tendency to gain weight and develop insulin resistance, you want to avoid carbohydrates. You want to stay away from anything that's processed um, because it's, it's sugars and it's those polyunsaturated fats that are primarily driving this inflammation in the cells of the body. And fasting will help with that as well? Yes, glad you mentioned that. Absolutely. Fasting will help with the insulin resistance, with the inflammation, and with the neurological dysfunction. And getting good sleep, absolutely. So the next time I go to my doctor and I get my cholesterol tested, what is the correct way to look at that test? Well, I very much discourage looking at one number and recommending an intervention or a treatment based on one number alone. In other words, when you get a cholesterol panel, a lipid panel, there's a lot of numbers there. You have total cholesterol, you have LDL, cholesterol, you've got triglycerides, HDL, VLDL. There's a lot of different things there. And really the way to look at that is you're looking for a pattern. So when I get a cholesterol report back um, of all those numbers, I really am most interested in triglycerides and HDL. And it's a ratio. It's a, it's a balance between those two numbers. We want triglycerides to be low and HDL to be high because that really is a very good indicator of how insulin sensitive somebody is and how much inflammation is going on. So if I see somebody, say you come into the clinic, you have a cholesterol panel, your triglycerides are 70 or something like that and your HDL is 60, you know, that's a really good, phenomenal ratio between those two numbers. That tells me you've got pretty low inflammation in your body and you're pretty insulin sensitive. Um, what I can surmise from that is that your LDL particles, it's very unlikely that a lot of them are damaged and problematic. So because of that, I can be more uh, accepting of an LDL number that's higher because again, its number one job is to deliver fat. 
as fuel. And so when I look at a cholesterol panel, that's what I see. What it tells me is this person's doing pretty well at burning fat for their primary fuel. Now, on the other hand, if triglycerides are really high, their HDL is very low, it indicates pretty clearly they are insulin resistant. They have a fair amount of inflammation going on, and I'm more suspicious that their LDL particles are damaged or modified. And so that's when, in my mind, we really need to do something to change that. Okay, Dr. Brown, let's destroy one more myth. So cholesterol in my diet influences the cholesterol in my blood? True or false? Very little influence. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons a lot of people in groups have recommended avoiding eggs or limiting eggs because they have a lot of cholesterol. Um, and it actually turns out dietary cholesterol has very little impact on the cholesterol in our blood. The body is so elegant and able to regulate that. Um, it almost makes no difference. And in fact, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association even they have dropped that as a recommendation. In other words, limiting cholesterol in the diet. It just, it's not the thing they thought it was in the past. So eggs are good. I eat a lot of eggs. Eggs are good. That's uh, the bottom line. But it, that idea is still out there. Uh, just listen to a cardiologist from a very prominent institution in the country um, being interviewed. And he said he only eats two and a half eggs a week because of the cholesterol, based on a study out of Northwestern. And anyway, I have problems with that study and how it was designed and all of that. But it, that idea is still out there, and it's a bit surprising that it is. I would tell you it, there's just no relationship, really, that should cause us to worry about cholesterol in the diet. That's great news, and I think a lot of people will be happy to hear they can eat eggs again. Good. Now, what I love about you and your program is that you challenge the status quo. And what I was taught about losing weight was wrong, meaning eating less, moving more. Um, you're lazy. Just get out and move. And that is all my fault. And it sounds like what I've been told about cholesterol is wrong, too. It's not the whole picture. Um, it's just... It's not the whole picture. And again, that's the pattern that you're looking for. There's a whole context. The human body is absolutely amazing. And we just have to be curious to see the bigger picture um, and what's really going on and what's most effective at lowering our risks for coronary artery disease. It's well, not thanks. a number. It's not a number. Well, thanks for coming in and thanks for illuminating us today. Any final thoughts, Dr. Brown? No, just great to be here with you, Mona. Um, I think it's an exciting time because for many reasons. One of them is there's such open access to information, and I'm very optimistic. Just had a, a meeting last night with physicians, and some were a little less optimistic. And I'm really a believer in the brightness of the future, and that's one of the reasons is that information becomes it has become so readily available. And so I'm excited. Always a pleasure, Dr. Brown. Thank, Thank you, you, Mona.